Welcome to Tain and Fern Free Church. We're delighted that services resumed in our church uh, buildings today. We're grateful to the Lord uh, for that. Next Sunday uh, is Easter Sunday. Uh, I'll be doing part two of our Easter series that Andrew uh, began this morning. So the series is entitled Truth on Trial. Truth on Trial. So this morning Andrew was looking at the court and next week we'll be considering the conclusion. So that's next Sunday. That's also the first Sunday of the month, which is the day that we've allocated for uh, the collection for our new church project. And can I just uh, thank all those who have given to it over the month of uh, March. We're very grateful uh, for the donations that have been made. And it's very encouraging uh, to see uh, that sum in the fund uh, growing. Well, we're going to begin our worship of God. We're going to sing, first of all, today from Psalm 103. So it's a Sing Psalms version of Psalm 103. Praise, the, praise God, my soul, with all my heart. Let me exalt his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. His praise, my soul, in song proclaim. We're singing verses 1 to 11 of this psalm to God's praise. praise you for that wonderful reminder of who you are and what you are like. You're you're not a God who's ready to lash out and to ensure that we get our just desserts when we step out of line. Instead, Lord, the Bible tells us that you're slow to anger and you abound in mercy. You, You don't treat us as our sin deserves, but instead, Lord, you reach out to us to draw us back to yourself. And it's no wonder that that psalm began with a summons to praise the Lord and forget not all the benefits, Lord, that you lavish upon us. Lord, help us to stir ourselves up, to to give you the praise and the worship that that is due to you. We know that 
when we count our blessings, it reminds us of just how privileged we are. And Lord, as we look back over our lives, we, we have to say that you have never failed us and you have never abandoned us. We know that we fail you. We know that there may have been times when we abandoned you, but Lord, yet you refuse eh, to let us go. So we want to thank you today for your faithfulness and for your commitment to your people. We thank you, Lord, that we've been able to return to church today. Uh, we, we were made to be together. We belong to the family of God, Lord. And we've missed that communal aspect of our, of our worship together. So we pray that you would continue to be working among us as a congregation and that you would be pleased to bless us, not because we are deserving of it, but because we ask these things. We, we seek your blessing and we ask for it in the name of of our Saviour Jesus. Be with, Lord, those uh, and who, are, who are elderly or those who have health issues or those who are caring for loved ones with health issues. Uh, all these things that prevent some people from being able to return to church at this time. Lord, we commit them to you and we pray that you would meet them as you see their need and that you would be pleased uh, to bless them. And and we long for the day and we pray for that day, Lord, when, when we can all return uh, with no restrictions upon us. Bless, Lord, uh, the many people who face challenging situations in their lives. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for those, Lord, who are hurting, following the passing of one they loved. Be near to the sick as well and those who are undergoing treatment, Lord. And we pray that these treatments would be successful. We remember, Lord, many others who are awaiting medical intervention and, and whose treatments have been delayed because of, because of COVID. And Lord, as we pray for our sick, we give thanks for those who care for them. We give thanks for our NHS. We give thanks, Lord, for all those who work in it. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, and thankful to them for their commitment to others and their service of others over this year that has passed. And Lord, we pray that you would be helping them in the work that they do. Bless your word then today. Bless it to ourselves. Bless it, Lord, as, as people turn to the Bible uh, right across the world. We ask, Lord, that, that your word would go forth with power and that you would be speaking through the Bible, speaking to ourselves here in, in Tain and Fern as a congregation and to all those who tune into our services and who tune in to listen to your word wherever they are in the world. Lord, we pray that you would bless it. May the Holy Spirit apply it powerfully to our lives in order to change us and make us more like Jesus. We pray today as well, Lord, for those who serve you in other countries, on the mission field, those maybe who endanger uh, their own lives, who, who are serving in, in places that are difficult. And particularly, Lord, when uh, travel restrictions mean that even if they have time off, they're not able to come home and and see their family. So we commit them to you, Lord. We think in particular today of the Garvey family uh, serving you in Nigeria. Uh, we pray for Donald. We are aware he's been unwell of late and struggling with malaria and with fatigue. Uh, so we ask, Lord, that you would draw near to him and that you would uh, strengthen him again and, and build him up, Lord, in his health and uh, restore him uh, to full health, Lord, that he'll be able to continue to serve you. We thank you that the children are content. And we pray your blessing on them as well. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep them safe. In a, in a country where there, is, where there are so many threats, Lord, we're grateful that we can commit them eh, to your loving care. So be with them. Be with us now as we turn to our Bibles, Lord. May, it, may this book always be a rule of life, our guidebook. May it be our source of comfort. Give us an appetite for your word. Give us a desire to study it often, Lord. And may you be speaking to us through it. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, let's uh, turn to God's word. Now we're going to read in the book of Judges and chapter 6. Book of Judges, chapter 6. I uh, hope this evening to begin a, a short study in the life of Gideon. Just a few services in the life of Gideon, uh, whom we read about in chapter 6 seven and uh, into eight chapter eight of the book of judges so today uh, we're looking at the call of gideon genesis sorry judges six we're going to read from verse one down to verse 24 of this chapter let's hear god's word 
Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, If now I have found favour in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and bread. The angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Amen. This is the word of the Lord and we trust and we pray that he'll follow it with his own blessing. Let me just read again from verse 13, the start of verse 13. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? I wonder if you've ever asked that question. If God is with me, why is all this happening to me? Whether it's trouble in your own life or in your family or whether it's a situation of our nation in the midst of its current turmoil. Maybe you're asking, what's God up to? Here God has allowed their enemies to wreak havoc on his own people, the Israelites. And he's allowed them because his own people had turned away from him. The reason they were in a mess was that they had neglected and rejected God. And they continued in that same mess year after year after year until 
now, at this point, we're out of the book, they finally cry out to the Lord for help. And in this chapter, we're going to see that God heard that cry. And he's going to use this man, Gideon, to deliver his people. Despite Gideon's protests that he's not up to the task, God promises that he will be with him. That he will be with him. You know, maybe there are lessons there for us today. Maybe there are things that we can learn from this. That promise that the Lord is, 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 is with you is a promise that is for every one of God's people. However weak you feel today, however difficult or impossible the situation that you face appears to be, God promises that he will be with you. So let's look then today at the call of Gideon, the call from God to deliver his people. So we'll look at four things. We will see here, first of all, the mess that they were in, and then the message God gave them, and then the man that God chose. And then the mission God gave him. These four headings, the mess, the message, the man, and the mission. So let's look at the mess then, first of all. So we're looking at verses 1 to 6 under this heading. And they describe for us a really sorry situation that the Israelites found themselves in. For seven years now, they had been at the mercy of their enemies. And these enemies were, they're, they're mentioned in verse 3, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern people. And these enemies attacked them annually, every year. They would wait until the Israelites had planted all their crops, and then they would come in their droves, and they would plunder the land. Look at how their attack is described, verse 5. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. And it wasn't just the land. It wasn't just the crops. Look at verse 4. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They were robbing them of their livestock as well as of their crops. Everything the Israelites needed for their sustenance was, was, was taken from them. And, and they were forced to retreat. They were forced into a, 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 almost a primitive lifestyle. You see that in, in, in verse 2. They had to flee to the mountains. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Here they were, God's people. He had brought them into the land of plenty, the land of Canaan, the promised land, land flowing with milk and honey. It had everything that they needed. And now they're eking out this primitive existence, living in caves in the mountains. What a mess! They were in. How, how did that happen? Well, verse 1 leaves us in no doubt how it happened. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. The Israelites did evil, so God handed them over to their enemies. You see, God doesn't turn a blind eye to our sin. He can't. He just can't. He'll not allow his people to continue doing their own thing, forgetting about him, expecting that they will get off with it. They won't. You might get off with it for a wee while. But God will never overlook sin. And so here we're seeing that the Israelites suffered for it. And you know, sadly, this had become the pattern in, 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 in the history of Israel, in the life of God's people. It's a pattern that you see right throughout this book of Judges. From chapter 2 onwards, it's the same. God God prospers them, first of all. They're doing well. And, and, and then they turn away from God and rebel against him. So God brings trouble on them. And after they've been in trouble for some time, they, they then turn back to God 
and God delivers them. It's a cycle. And they repeat this cycle. There's rebellion, followed by retribution, followed by repentance, followed by rescue. And then it happens again and again. And that's exactly what we're seeing here uh, in the passage that we're studying today. If you just look at the closing words of, of, of the previous chapter, chapter 5, what are we told? There's prospering. Then the land had peace for 40 years. Four decades. Things were going well. No trouble. No trouble. But you know, that's when God's people are much more likely to get complacent. That's the danger time. When life is easy. And when things are going well. And you know that yourself. You know that when things are good, you're, you're not as reliant on the Lord as you should be. When, when, when you don't have any trouble, you're not as prayerful as you would be if, if trials came. And, and maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe life has been good. And, 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 and here you are and, and, and you've relaxed. You, you're no longer relying on the Lord like you ought to be. And you know, when you stop relying on the Lord, when you stop being close to the Lord, you're much more likely then to get embroiled in sin. That's how it happened for the Israelites. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> and now they're paying the price for that. Look at verse 6. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. They were in a bad way. They were in dire straits at this point. Seven long years they had suffered at the hands of their enemies before they eventually cry out to God. How stubborn they'd become. How headstrong. How hard of heart. It appears that God was an absolutely last resort. And yet how amazing that when they cry out to him, he still responds. He still responds. Oh, today... If you've hardened your heart. Today if you've wandered away from God. Is it not time to call out to him? Is it not time to turn back to him? Don't wait until you reach rock bottom. Don't wait until you're impoverished like the Israelites. The Bible says today if you hear his voice. Do not harden your heart. That's the first thing today that we see. In this chapter, we see the mess, the mess. But then secondly, I want to look at the message. So we're now moving to verses 7 down to 10. Verse 7 to 10. Imagine if you one day, you dialed 999 and called for the fire brigade to help rescue you from some danger. But instead of sending a fire brigade, the control room instead sent out an assessor to investigate your predicament and present you with a report. It would seem a little odd. And yet it's something like that that we see happening here next, because we're told that when they cried to the Lord for help, he sent them a prophet. A prophet, not a deliverer. He sent them someone who would provide them with an assessment of their situation, of their condition. Why would he do that? Well, because while people often, their, their first priority is to, to be set free from whatever trouble they're in. It is important that they understand why they ended up in trouble in the first place. So rather than send a deliverer, God sent a prophet. And there's application there for ourselves in our current situation, still in a pandemic. The vast majority of us, we, we just want that to end. Uh, the church too. We, we want it over with so that we can get back to normal. But what if our normal is the reason God sent the pandemic in the first place? What if that was the problem? Instead of seeking relief, ought we not to be asking the Lord, why are we in this mess in the first place? Here, the message that the prophet brought, it had two parts to it. There was remembrance and there was reason. 
So the remembrance, first of all, of what God had done for them. You see it in the middle of verse 8 into verse 9. In the middle of verse 8. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. That's a reminder of what God has done for them in the past. And now comes the reason. Verse 10. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. You have not listened to me. God says, I did X, Y, and Z for you. And I asked you to do one thing for me. One thing. Steer clear of their false gods. But Israel didn't listen. They began to mingle with the heathen. And that was followed by marriages with the heathen. And very soon they descended into the same false gods, into the same idolatry as the heathens around them. They worshipped the gods of the Amorites. You see, after some time, after when things were well, when they were prospering, when they had peace, they wanted to be free from God's restraint. And as they broke free from God's restraint, what happened? Oh, they were encompassed and encamped and entrapped by a brutal enemy instead. They wanted to do their own thing. They didn't want God's constraints. Where does it bring them? Hiding in caves, trying to survive. It's hardly the freedom they wanted or expected. And how often does Satan still whisper his lies in our ears? How often does the enemy come and say, your life could be much more exciting if you just park God to the side. Stop listening to him. He's a spoiled sport. And you know, maybe for a time you will have some freedom. But it will always end in tears. It will always end in tears. Oh, you know what's amazing about this? is God's kindness and actually sending them a prophet to say, this is where you went wrong. This is what needs to be fixed. We need to learn from our mistakes. Friends, what we need more than anything today is that we hear what God has to say to us. You need to hear it in your own life and situation. And we need to hear it it collectively as a nation as well. The questions, the questions people are asking, they're asking all the wrong questions. When, I get, when can I get back to the pub, to the club, to the restaurant? When will my sport resume? When can we party again? Instead, we should be asking, why did this trouble come upon us? Is it because we didn't listen to the word of God? You know, it's our duty as Christians. It's the duty of the church to be asking these questions. Because it is his people, his own people, that God most often calls to repentance. Yes, he calls sinners to repentance. He calls the ungodly to repentance. But most of the time in the Bible, it's his own people. That he's calling back to himself. It's his own people that he calls to reform. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. What's the message then? The message. We looked at the mess. We considered the message. Thirdly, the man. The man. Finally, we come to meet Gideon, who is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, that's a little odd because wheat was usually threshed on, on some kind of summit where the, where the wind would blow the chaff away. 
whereas a wine press was usually some kind of hollow in the ground. But we're told why, why Gideon is there. He's there because he's hiding the wheat from the Midianites. He's in hiding. And the angel of the Lord that comes and that speaks to him, greets him with these words in verse 12. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, that, 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 that almost seems sarcastic when you read it in the context and with the picture we have of where Gideon is right now. There doesn't seem to be much mighty about him. He doesn't come across as a warrior. He's hiding in a wine press, keeping a low profile. And, and when he then speaks, he doesn't come across as, as a mighty warrior either. First, he, he asks this question. And it's a good question and it's a fair question. Verse 13, it may be a question you ask. But Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The situation, as Gideon sees it, clearly suggests that God has abandoned them. To say that the Lord was with them seems at odds with their circumstances. No, but the truth is that while Israel had abandoned God, God never abandoned them. And you know, we've seen this many times before, but it's worth reiterating and it's certainly worth remembering that the presence of trouble does not mean the absence of God. The presence of trouble does not mean the absence of God. And the angel of the Lord calls Gideon to go and save Israel out of the hand of the Midians. And listen to his protest. Verse 15, But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. You've got the wrong guy, Lord. I'm not up to this task. But you know, friends, whenever God calls someone to a task, he equips them for that work. Gideon might not be a mighty warrior now, but he will be. He will be as he steps out in obedience to the command of God, to the call of God on his life. And you know, it's wonderful how, how the angel of the Lord addresses him in this way. And this encouraging man, an almighty warrior. And do we not need such encouragements? You know, we, we, we don't really need reminders of our own frailty and of our own failings. Any Christian who is exercised in any way is, is well aware of their own weaknesses and of their own frailties, of their own insufficiency for the task. But what we do need to be reminded of is the might that is at our disposal as followers of Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors, the Bible says, through him who loved us. And when you're relying on the Lord, you can say just as the apostle Paul did, I can do all things through Christ, who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ. Or maybe today, maybe today you're feeling incredibly weak. Maybe today you feel insufficient for the task that God has given you, or for the trial which God has brought into your life. But oh, what might is at your disposal when you lean heavily on the Lord. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So that's the man, thirdly. We, we saw the mess, we looked at the message, we've met the man. Fourthly, finally and fairly briefly, the mission. The mission that we've already touched on this in the previous point. The angel of the Lord gave Gideon a mission. It's there in verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel 
out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So there's a mission and there's a, a reminder of it. Go, am I not sending you? And we've seen his protests. He protests about his own inadequacy. Verse 15, my clan is the weakest and I am, I am the least in my family. But God responds with this wonderful promise. In verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. What a wonderful assurance that is. I will be with you. And you know, God repeatedly makes that promise to those whom he, whom he, whom he calls to service. He made it to Moses, did he not, when he met with him at the burning bush and asked him to go down to Egypt to lead his people out of slavery. He made it to Joshua when Joshua was going to have to take over from Moses. Remember what God said, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. That is God's promise to all his people. Whatever he calls you to do for him or calls you to suffer for him, he says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Here that promise is made to Gideon who will deliver God's people from their enemies. God's adequacy will more than make up for Gideon's inadequacy. This mere weakling will become a mighty warrior. A mighty warrior. And do you know, friends, there is, there is courage in the consciousness of God's commission. There is courage in the consciousness of God's commission. When we know that God has called us to do something, we can take courage, we can be confident that he will enable us to achieve it. God called Gideon to save his people and God's going to ensure that he is able to do that. And can we not thrust him to equip us for whatever he puts in our path? Amen. May he bless these thoughts to us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that we can thrust you. We thank you that you're faithful. We thank you, Lord, that you do equip. You give grace for whatever situations we face in life as we lean more heavily on you. Oh, we know it's not an easy position to be in. When our own strength is sapped. When we feel weak and powerless and useless. But we thank you that as the Bible reminds us, your promise is, my strength is perfected in your weakness. Help us, Lord, to rely on you more and more. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's finish a singing from Psalm 77, the Sing Psalms version of that psalm, Psalm 77, and at verse 7, singing down to verse 14, the tune is Amazing Grace, Psalm 77, at verse 7. Forever will the Lord reject and never show his grace? Has he withdrawn his steadfast love and turned from me his face? Big question important questions and the psalm goes on to answer them as we sing it together psalm 77 from verse 7 down to verse 14 to god's praise
of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.